All right, we are recording. Uh, hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and start. Uh, for those of you who are here the last period, feel free if you would like to uh, interject. I will try to check the chat. When I'm sharing my screen, it's difficult for me to see the chat. So if someone wants to, uh, to uh, point out that something has been said in the chat, I will be uh, so happy to uh, things. And greetings to everyone who's here. I see that uh, we have a couple new people from the, the last class, and you're most welcome. Um, the last class was kind of a survey of what you could do with astronomy within the SCA. And this class is going to be on the use of astrolabes. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Uh, we'll actually share the screen since I'm going to be going back and forth in a little bit. All right, so um, here we go. Everybody see this? All right, uh, this is Astronomy 2, Beginning Medieval Celestial Observation. Um, an overview of how celestial observation was done within the Ptolemaic tradition. Um, you know, in the SCA, we kind of study, well, let me introduce myself first for the new people. Um, uh, my name is Honorable Lord Taran Sirav. Uh, my persona is a Mongol of the 13th, 4th century, especially the Golden Horde. Uh, my favorite concentrations are pre-17th astronomy, astronomy, alchemy, uh, Mongol persona, and heraldry. I have a uh, website here on the bottom that has lots of uh, useful information and bibliographies and things for you to uh, expand your uh, library on these kind of topics. Um, in, um, in the last class, we kind of talked about the Ptolemaic tradition. And, um, you know, in the SCA, we really kind of study up right up to 1700 for our resources, although our, the focus of our study is, you know, somewhere around 1600, 1603, you know, somewhere on the death of Queen Elizabeth II. But if you really look at this study, this is not a, a period of telescopes. I mean, telescopes are really just coming into, into their own in the 1600s. And while there's a lot of interesting optical things going along, uh, this was mostly naked eye astronomy. And uh, the astronomy that was that th this class is focused on is the Ptolemaic tradition, which started out in ancient Greece, um, and before that in Babylon, Mesopotamia, then ancient Greece, then came over to the medieval and uh, Arabic and Islamic world, and then was taken back through the Crusades to medieval Europe, and uh, then uh, concentrated and became the Renaissance. So this is kind of the tradition that the, these kind of pools and these kind of studies that we're doing comings from. If you wanted to be an astronomer from the time of the ancient Greeks all the way through the 1600s, you needed to study one book, and that book was Ptolemy's Algamist. Um, its Greek name is something more like 13 books about celestial motion by Claudius Ptolemy. Algamist is more of an Arabic word that means like masterwork. Um, but the, in ancient Greece, maybe you did start with the Algamist. I mean the Algamist, but uh, it became more difficult than as the Muslims translated and added their commentaries and the Latins translated and gave their comedies that people no longer started, the al started with the alchemist. They needed uh, primers and other manuals to lead them up into the alchemist. And so um, this tradition became using of being pre-alchemist, but you weren't necessarily a serious astronomer until you had worked your way through the alchemist. Um, and so it's probably the most important work for um, this kind of Ptolemaic astronomy that we're talking about. Now, I recommend a pre-algamist, um, the Evans, the history and uh, practice of ancient astronomy that kind of works our way through a lot of this. And so um, that's the, the tradition that we're gonna be talking about here in, in, in this class. Um, now, dividing the heavens. Um, this is kind of like a skeletal structure of the medieval world. Uh, does everyone see the mouse moving around here? Uh, is it possible to see? Well, this, uh, we see that the Earth is at the center um, of this skeletal sphere. And you have this thing here, which is the prime meridius around the outside. Uh, this big band with the words of the zodiac on it are called the ecliptic. That's the path of the sun around the Earth. Um, then in the center here, you have the equator, and then you have the two tropical circles and the two Arctic circles. Um, and uh, this wooden uh, plane here serves as the horizon. And so this is basically what a, uh, what, how they divided up the heavens. Um, the tropics are at about 30 degrees from the equator and the, uh, the arctics are around the top circle. Um, let's look at another view of this. Well, actually, I guess what's, um, yeah, I'm gonna stop sharing here. And let's see if I can spotlight this. This is a, 
Oh, everything went away. Ah, there we go. This is a uh, an opaque celestial sphere. In the center, you see we have the Earth. We have the sun moving around the past the elliptic. And you have the, this, this plastic piece is the fixed background of stars. Um, the moon and the planets also run around the elliptic. This metal bar serves as the horizon. This thick plastic line serves as our equator. Here is our prime meridian, our tropics, and of course our arctic circles. And so you, they use this in a, astronomy classes today to kind of give people a surveyor's perspective of, of how, how the stars appear to work from Earth. And you, so you can use, accurately use this to predict where the sun is and what stars will be up when and these kind of things. Um, one thing I noticed I talked about before is the elliptic, the elliptic around it, you have the signs of the zodiac. So let's say you're born in, um, let's say you're born in August, uh, that's when the constellation Leo is around the elliptic. And so you cannot see the constellation Leo um, in the month of August because the sun is in that constellation. So now that we have the sun set to Leo, um, if we wanted to see, um, we would just uh, move, uh, just move this, the, that until we got the uh, sun below the horizon. And then this is what the stars would look like at some point in time with that taken care of. Um, but that's kind of a modern device. The, 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 uh, the one we looked at in this other view was uh, a medieval skeletal version of that. I'm going to go back to trying to share the screen. All right. So... If you're going to chart the heavens, if you're going to try to do astronomy, um, it is necessary to keep track of observations. There are three major ways that you might go about uh, keeping track of observations. There's the horizontal coordinate method, where you take the altitude and the zooth uh, This is basically you take two measurements, how high something is from the horizon and how many degrees something are from zero. And zero is normal. And last time, class we talked about two ways of figuring out where north is. Uh, one, you can use nomen to plot the shadow points of the sun throughout the day. Uh, the local noon, which is the shortest shadow plot that can be obtained from uh, this, is points to, to uh, local or to north. You could also use the compass. The compasses do not actually point to north. They point to magnetic north. And there's a difference in angles between true north and magnetic north. And so you'd want to know that local difference so that you, your zero is truly north, um, so that you can communicate better with other astronomers. Um, there's also the celestial equator coordinates method, which uses the D inclination and right ascension. Uh, this is good for any uh, grid in the heavens. Um, the right ascension is measured as the eastward angle along, let me hide this real quick, um, the equatorial plane at around point 24. So the vernal equinox is zero, one hour equals about 15 degrees. Um, and so this is a more complicated way. And then there's the ecliptic coordinate method, which is good for any location on Earth. Um, the first method we talked about is only good for local uh, measurements. The second one is also good for any location. And then the third one, of course, is good for any location. The third one, you also need to know your angular distance below and below the ecliptic. And you need to know the right ascension measured from the vernal equinox. And uh, this way you could communicate your findings with people across the, uh, across the world. Now, before we get into the quadrant, um, is there any questions or uh, comments? All right. Um, we talked about the quadrant before. The quadrant is an instrument used to determine the angular distance or elevation. So, um, so you can use degrees of zero things. This is a recreation of the one from the site I was talking about last time, who does the nocturnes and the other instruments as well, um, Richard Pasisk. This is one he made. Um, and this uh, one on the right is Tycho Brahe's. So you see, a quadrant could be a handheld instrument, and it could be something that is uh, 
taller than a human being that you can use to measure. And there's advantages to both sizes. So I've got to stop sharing real quick. I don't know if anyone can see this. This is a um, simple quadrant I made. And uh, I also make class sets out of them, out of cardboard. So a quadrant is just basically a fourth of a circle. You can get a, a protractor and uh, measure out half the degrees. Um, I have 10 to 90 measured. So you have this line with the weight on it, and that's your plumb line. You have generally a site here and a site here where you can measure along the top. Um, when it's at zero, that is your horizon. So if you want to know how high something is, you choose the object in your sky, you, you cite it correctly, you hold the string down, and then you read the measurement. The item I measured was around 43, 42 degrees from the horizon. So again, when we're recording one of our locations, that's one of our coordinates for beginning to, to write down where things are, at least locally. Now you can also use this for determining zero. If you know that this is north, uh, and you know you have 360 degrees, well, this is 90, this is 90, this is 90, and this is 90. So you can measure, say this is north, and the object was here. So you have 90, and 90 is 180, 275, and then you can kind of plot out the remaining measure and measure it this way. It's harder to use the fourth than it will be to like use an astrolabe, but this one instrument can, uh, can kind of do this for you. Uh, this is a badly drawn shadow box, which people use to determine the, uh, the shadows of the sun. That's a trigonomic function that we probably won't be talking about, but you could use the protractor as a quadrant if you needed to in a, in a, in a pinch. A, quad, a protractor is only like a double quadrant. You know, you have that much. So you could just hang, hang a plumb line from the middle of it and use a protractor as a a quadrant in a, in a pinch. Um, questions about quadrants? I'm going to just try to share the screen again so we can move on to astrolabes. All right, the astrolabe is kind of like the skeletal version of the armillary sphere, the celestial sphere. So everything that's uh, represented on that globe I showed you, or on the celestial sphere in one of the first images, is represented on the astrolabe. This round circle here is the ecliptic. These other things uh, represent different points on stars. This he center here is the prime meridian, and you have different degrees and things of this nature. Um, on the front, we call this metal, this metal piece with all these little pointy ends, uh, the reet, and it represents the celestial sphere with a number of stars on it. Under the reet, you have what's called a latitude plate, um, and it's what makes the astrolabe work. The latitude plate is actually somewhat different for each latitude. And so lati astro astrolabes are not good for all places on Earth unless you have latitude plates for all uh, places on Earth. And many astrolabes do come with multiple sets of latitude plates, or they make them. Um, like a set that way. Uh, and then there is the rule, and that is the piece that helps you line up all of these things. Um, now we also have the back of the astrolabe, where you have kind of like another sighting aid here, so that you can use the, uh, the astrolabe as a quadrant. Now of course you have all 360 degrees possible here to measure. Uh, the back plate is fixed, it doesn't have any moving parts besides the allayed which just helps you line up and measure things. Um, on the right, we have all the different parts of the astrolabe laid out. So we have here the rule, the allayed, the reed, uh, the back plate, and here we have the latitude plate. So the latitude would be connected to the back plate, you put the reed over the latitude plate, and you would put um, the rule um, on top of the reed, and then you'd put this on the back plate. You'd put your, uh, your pen in to hold everything. And then you could have a, a functioning uh, 
a functioning astrolabe. So um, here now I want to try to work through different um, different uh, exercises with you. Now if you go to my website, which is astroblogspot.com, you click on astronomy resources, all the way down at the bottom, you will find something called the Astrolabe Project. When you go to the Astrolabe Project, oh, that didn't work right, um, then you have this uh, website called, let me pull it up real quick. Then you have all this useful information about astrolabes. One of the tools they have there is called an astrolabe simulator. If you click on it, you get this. Um, and this will help you, uh, this will be what I'll be using for, to work through these exercises with you. Now, at, ordinarily I have like a class set of these and we walk through and do all these together. So if you want, we can tr you can try to pull this up and do this with me, or you can just watch what I'm doing and uh, play with the simulator at a different point in time. If you have questions, feel free to um, be done. Let me see. I, I'm seeing the chat here. Um, Bridgetana asked, uh, will there be a handout be available for everyone later as a download? Um, I have a handout I can send you. If, um, at the end of the class, make sure I have your email address as well as uh, if you go to the um, if you go to uh, this this video will be posted for for future referencing. Um, all right, so going back to the astrolabe, um, our first exercise is to determine the rising position of a star. Um, where on the um, horizon will Bellatrix rise? Okay, so let's go back to our thing and see if we can find Bellatrix. Bellatrix is posted right here. Now this line right here that runs under the reet is the horizon. This is the western horizon. This is the eastern horizon. So if we take the point of Bellatrix and we put it there, that is where Bellatrix will rise on the horizon. Karen, you are not screen sharing at the moment. Oh, that's good to know. Let me see if I can get back and do that. All right. Am I screen sharing now? Yes, you are. All right. So here is our, uh, here's our first exercise, determining the rising position of a star. We determined we would start with Bellatrix. Now, Bellatrix is determined by, you see the word here, Bellatrix, and here is the point. So that point is where Bellatrix is on the thing. This uh, curved line here that runs under the reet is the horizon. This is the western horizon. This is the eastern horizon. So we take the reet and we move the reet to the horizon. That is where Bellatrix will rise. Now, each of these things is degrees. Um, and they are done in 10 segments. So the first one is zero and goes from 80. So this line, by the way, here is north towards you and south towards the other way. So we could literally count, um, let's see here. Looking at my other one. All right, so 10, 20, uh, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, and then we move so we can kind of see. Uh, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 90. So the first one is 90, then one, two, three, Four, five. Can find Bellatrix again. So Bellatrix is going to be at around 50 degrees from the horizon. 
Now, a lot of these astrolabes actually have the numbers here, and this one did the other day when I was using it, but it is not here at the present. So uh, I apologize for the lack of numbers in this. Um, but that is how you determine the uh, angle of Bellatrix. Now, I can't see if there is any uh, thing going on in the chat. Has anyone asked any questions? Does everyone kind of see that okay? There are no questions currently posted. You are good. All right, thank you. All right, so now let's go to the next exercise. Uh, the meridian altitude of the star. The meridian altitude would be how high it is when the, the uh, star crosses the meridian altitude. So to work through this solution, uh, the meridian is this line that runs from south to north over every a viewer. Uh, they call the zenith, the point directly over your head, the nadar directly the point under your feet. And the meridian runs as a north-south line uh, directly over. So let's, uh, let's take a different star because we see where Regis is. Um, let's take Sirius, which is right here. So if we take the reed and we move the reed until Sirius is on the uh, meridian line here, we find that this is 40, and that's 30, and then that is 20. So this is about 35. And so uh, Sirius will be about 35 degrees from the meridian um, at local midnight, um, which is when it usually conquers that. The, in the daytime, it would be local noon. At nighttime, it would be local midnight. So that, that's where it would be in the middle of the night. That's where you can determine um, when it crosses there. So the, the other natural thing is to see, well, well, how high would the star be when it sets? We can all, you just take the same star and you, uh, you move it, if the reed will listen to me, till uh, you read the western horizon and that's the, uh, the particular amount of degrees. So, and that's, that's how you tell um, where something would set. So, 30, 20, okay, so we have around 30, 20, so I think this would be around 35 or 40 degrees um, when it sets below the horizon. Now, we can do more than just to determine the rising settings of the stars. We can also work on this with the sun. So let's uh, go back to our exercises and see what the next exercise is. Um, the position of the sun on the ecliptic. Let's say, where is the sun's position on February 4th? So we take our, go back to our simulator, and we flip it to the back. Now we can use these dates here to find February. And this is February uh, 1st here. So February 4th is going to be about there. And so we know that the sun is going to be in Aquarius at approximately uh, five degrees. So um, we flip this over. We look for Aquarius. <laughs> oh, here's Aquarius. And we put Aquarius at about five degrees. You can see where it's about the halfway point between the 10 and the 20, which is where, well, actually there, because that's 10 and that's zero. So Aquarius five, that is where the sun will rise, how many degrees the sun will rise on February 4th. Now, if you want to know the setting time, well, let's go back to the exercise, because I think that's the next exercise. Um, the rising position of the sun. So we went ahead and did that. Let's move to our next uh, set of exercises the noon altitude of the sun, which is the same way. We take Aquarius at roughly five degrees. We move it to the, uh, the meridian here, and we can see that it's going to be about 20 degrees from the horizon when it rises on uh, February 4th. And so that is going to be when local noon is. So if you didn't want to take your gnomon out and create shadow plots to find the shortest plot of the day, you could just take your... Uh, you could take your quadrant or your astrolabe, and you could just see when it's about that degree from the, 
from the horizon, the meridian horizon, and you know that that was local noon. Now, for the setting time, of course, we just move it to the western horizon right here, and that gives us our, um, our setting altitude from the west. So, going back to our exercises, the time a star spins above the horizon, how long will Beatrix uh, be above the horizon every day? So we go back to our, our star, and we have here, let's do, if I can find uh, Beatrix again, here's Beatrix, and here is uh, Beatrix on the horizon. Now what we're gonna do is we're going to go to Beatrix here. But we, we also notice that there are hours that are done here. And so um, you choose the day. And uh, if you want to find out the nighttime thing is fine, let's say, let's say we're going to do Aquarius 5 because uh, that's what we've been doing. So when Aquarius 5 hits the western horizon where the sun sets, um, we, uh, we keep track of where it is. All right. And so we're, now we need to find where our Beatrix is. It's here. Um, so, Beatrix will be right here when the sun sets on February 4th. So, we want to know how long it's going to be above the horizon that day. Um, so, what we do is uh, we have to kind of align our hours. So... Beatrix is here. And so then we move, we keep in check that Beatrix is here. Now we move Beatrix to the, uh, the sunset. We can see, um, we'll just estimate this being, uh, well, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And there's a little fraction left here and a little fraction here. So Beatrix is probably going to be up around eight hours that night. Um, and you can just do the simple counting of hours with that particular method to find out how, how much of the night something is going to be up. And again, these are seasonal hours that are varying according to local time. You have 12, 12 hours of daylight and 12 hours of nighttime, but they're not equal depending on when it is. So the summer solstice, which is today, you have the most, um, the daylight hours longer. In the winter solstice, you know, roughly December 21st, you have the longest nighttime hours. And so the seasonal hours are longer or shorter depending on where you are in the sun cycle. Moving along to, um, to the, the length of daylight, um, you do it the same way, except for you use the, uh, the uh, ecliptic. So, um, let's see here. We'll do Sagittarius uh, or uh, December 1st. So, December 1st to the setting, and then you would count the hours, and it would be 12 for seasonal. Um, but you can, you can tell the... Uh, you can use the daytime and these hour references here at roughly the same points. Um, but again, the important thing to remember is that they're seasonal hours and not uh, fixed hours. So it's um, getting started in, in astronomy. I said it, the, the best two things you need is you need your pre algamist and your algamist. You need uh, Ancient Astronomy by James Evans, um, The History and Practice of Ancient Astronomy, and this will get you ready for the Algamist. And then you need Algamist. Now, uh, on my website, what I, which I was showing you before, I have all of these, um, all of these different annotated resources here. So you can look at them and read through the annotated resources and see if they're the kinds of things you would be interested in. 
Um, and if they are, you can know to buy them or to not buy them as you think. Again, if you're looking to be do serious astronomy, I think it's best to start with the ancient practice of astronomy and the algorithms. If you're not looking to do serious astronomy, I would still probably start with the history and practice of ancient astronomy, and then I would just probably pick books as they interest you. Um, because the Alabamist really is a tough read and somewhat mathematical. Um, now, we do have about, I guess, uh, 25 minutes left. Um, now, ordinarily in this time is eaten up because everyone is holding an astrolabe and kind of working through the material. So I'm having to point things out on the astrolabe um, and, uh, and make sure everybody's looking at the right points. Um, I have a couple printout astrolabes here. This is the one I used for my class. Uh, it has a plastic reet, and I've laminated it. The back looks very, very similarly to the uh, to the one that we were using for the uh, for the simulator. There's also this uh, paper astrolabe that you can buy from Amazon, roughly the same way, except for the plastic reed looks has like the the sharp points and jots more like the medieval ones do, as opposed to um, this one, which has like points and dots and more mathematical lines. Um, using an astrolabe as a, uh, as a uh, quadrant is quite simple. You hold it by its ring, you look to see how high something is, and you move the, uh, the, the cider, to where it is, and then you can see how many degrees it is from the horizon, because you would just be working with kind of like this. And when you're looking at for zero, you say, well, this is north, the object is right there, and so that's how many degrees it is from north, and that's how many degrees it is from the horizon. So you can do this very simply with an astrolabe. Now, the history and practice of ancient astronomy does have patterns for the astrolabe and several other astronomical tools in the back of it. So you can print and use your own astrolabe um, if you buy the history and practice of ancient astronomy. Now, you can also print your own astrolabe from several different sites that I have on my website, like the Astrolabe Project where we're using the simulator and different places too. The important thing to remember though is that the information is not going to be valid for you if you don't use the correct latitude plate. And the latitude plate is different for each location. Um, so that took up a little bit more time, but not an exceptional amount more time. Do we have any questions, comments, side remarks? Um, if you want the handout, I can try to, to take your emails now. Um, if you want to try to pull up that or ask questions about astrolabes, I am very happy to talk more about astrolabes. Um, ancient Greece, believe it or not, uh, the, the astrolabes that we have were for the most part worked the same way in ancient Greece. Um, and throughout all of the Mis Islamic period, they were improved and made more intricate. But uh, they work pretty much like they do now from ancient Greece all the way through the end of the Renaissance. And uh, we're probably the most iconic of all the medieval astronomical tools, although quadrants were probably more common and gnomons were probably more common. But uh, for the most part, they're mostly the same from ancient Greece. That question for those of you who aren't reading the chat was when were the astrolabes standardized? As far as SCA resources go, we have two, um, we have two, complete anachronists that are devo devoted to the astrolabe by a very good gentleman. Um, one of them is on the use of the astrolabe and one of them is on its construction. Uh, this person is mostly summarizing the work of, um, of uh, Morrison who wrote the astrolabe book. It's out of print now, around four or five hundred dollars, but is the authoritative book on the astrolabes written. The Babylonians did have something similar to an astrolabe, 
they had rectangular astrolabes and circular astrolabes, uh, but they did not necessarily um, move the way we um, the way we think of. Let me see if I can find the picture of the uh, Babylonian astrolabe for you. Um, here is a circular um, Babylonian astrolabe, and it's more of a standstill kind of thing. It works very well, and uh, they were still able to use it for for charts. And uh, Evans also has a picture of the rectangular astrolabes. But it's not coming up quickly. So um, but the Babylonians did have astrolabes. Babylonians, though, were more traditionally concerned with meticulous observation of the planets and with, um, with the, or the particular meticulous observation of the celestial bodies and particularly the planets. Uh, the Babylonians did a lot to, um, to make us work on planetary theory. Um, the last class, um, a great deal of the planetary theory we discussed comes from ancient Babylon. And then of course it was refined and pushed a little bit by Ptolemy. But um, the first, uh, all the first lookings at planetary theory that we're going to discuss in that fourth class um, are Babylonian. They were very interested in the planets' risings and motions. So the next class we're going to do, there's an hour break before we get back to astronomy. And that class is on solar and lunar theory. Uh, we're going to go through what the, uh, what the medievals and the Greeks thought about um, how the sun operates and how the uh, moon operates. Primarily the sun, but we'll get into the moon too and eclipses and things of that nature. And then the third class is going to be on uh, planetary theory, which is the more complicated of sense. Um, but uh, that is kind of what we've been. So this class, or the first class, was to give you a survey of the different types of things going on that you could do with medieval astronomy. This class is to get you thinking about doing astronomy by how you'd use tools to plot uh, the stars in the heavens and find the risings and settings so you could record them. The uh, next class is for you to start thinking about um, the fundamentals of how the system actually works and you need to work out the sun before you work the rest of the celestial bodies. And then the last class is about the planetary theory. The lunar theory I cover with the sun with specific points, but the lunar theory is its own thing. And uh, I do not, um, so it's kind of messed with the sun for our purposes today. Uh, I have um, Brigitina's uh, from Atlantia's, I have your email down. If anyone else would like a ha handout, uh, please send me your email in the uh, chat and I will copy and paste it to my list of people who want handouts and I will email it to you uh, later today probably this evening after we finish, but um, thank you all for coming. Um, I guess we could probably uh, turn off the recording and uh, I'll hang out till the 